Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I'm going to talk about bioremediation. So previously, I had made an introductory video of bioremediation, so you may check it out. So moving on with today's video. So in this video, as you can see, this slide I've discussed in the overview part of the previous video, which I made for bioremediation, which in which we talked about the types or the methods of bioremediation, which were biostimulation, bioaugmentation, and intrinsic bioremediation. So moving on from there. So coming to some of the parts of or methods of bioremediation. So starting off with biostimulation uh, and bioaugmentation. All right. So biostimulation is nothing but it's the modification of environmental conditions to stimulate existing microorganisms capable of bioremediation. Also, it has substrate or nutrients and oxygen added in the environment to help the microorganisms grow more rapidly and break down the toxic contaminants. Also, it involves techniques such as biosparging, bioventing, and extra and uh, more of them such as these. So, biosparging is nothing but sparging of air or air bubbles or oxygen, and such as bioventing is such that we give uh, give the particular medium some more nutrients or substrate for the survival. Also, talking about bioaugmentation. So microorganisms that are very efficient at degrading a certain contaminant are additionally added. All right. Also, genetically modified exogenous micro microbes are added, such as such as uh, methylocinous uh, trichosporium bacteria degrades trichloroethylene. Also, acidia cylindrospora fungi, which degrades fluorine. So these are some of the important uh, microbes. Uh, that are added for degrading certain contaminants as you can see so this was part of bio augmentation so more of that so talking about the in, uh, intrinsic bio remediation all right so this simply uh, it allows bio uh, biodegradation to occur under natural conditions and it's a long term exposure to biodegradable waste which develops indigenous soil microorganisms that effectively degrades contaminants also, it is also called the natural attenuation or natural remediation or intrinsic remediation. So this is a very much natural process that allows uh, microorganisms to develop in a particular waste or particular biodegradable substance so that it can degrade the contaminants. Also, it is carried out by indigenous subs, uh, subsurface microorganisms and it's a passive remedial approach that depends upon natural processes to degrade soil or water contaminants all right so and it requires biostimulation by augmentation for faster and efficient bioremediation so these are some of the important enhancing methods that are used in intrinsic bioremediation for by making the process faster or they making the degradation of soil or water contaminants quicker uh, so these are some of the important points so as you can see there are some of the important terms as you can see uh, Bio intrinsic bioremediation has a many names such as natural attenuation, uh, natural remediation, intrinsic remediation, and it is a passive remedial approach, which is basically a natural process to degrade contaminants and also requires biostimulation and bioaugmentation for faster efficient process. Moving on from there, so talking about the mixed microbial population. So to, what is the mixed microbial population? So the mixed microbial population is nothing but the combination of indigenous and the exogenous microorganisms. So indigenous, now, now we know that ex, uh, indigenous micro, microbe species are generally found naturally in the contaminated site. So these are uh, microbes which are generally found or grow over a period of time and exogenous microorganisms which, are, which we will study further up. So this is the mixed microbial population, which is the combination of indigenous and exogenous microorganisms. So what are the advantages of using mixed microbial population for bioremediation? Uh, so this is the complete degrading of xenobiotics. So definitely it, uh, it finishes off all of the contaminants or xenobiotics. And one microorganisms may produce a growth factor or nutrient required by the other. Also, co-culture may lead to plasmid transfer into a recipient species, transforming them into a faster grower and capable of degrading 
xenobiotics. So these are some of the important advantages that helps in degrading a higher level of contaminants. All right. So as we can see, one microorganism may produce growth factor and nutrient required by the other so that they can survive for a longer period and degrade more and more contaminants. And also co-culture may lead to plasmid transfer. So particular culturing uh, leads to plasmid transfer into the recipient species and transfer uh, transforming them into a faster growers and capable of degrading xenobiotics. So definitely plasmid transfer and all of that helps or more helps in modifying their features for it and better uh, enhancing the features for degrading xenobiotics. So organisms in bioremediation. So organisms in bioremediations are known as bioremediators. All right. So they are, they are some of the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells that are involved in this process. So the prokaryotic cells are bacteria, blue green algae and cyanobacteria. And eukaryotic cells are plants, animals, rotifiers, protozoa, fungi, algae. And the most important groups to bioremediation are bacterial and fungi, bacteria and fungi. So bacteria and fungi are the two important, as you can see, these are highlighted in blue. So these two are important or these two are the main uh, microbes that play the massive part in bioremediation. And the species of two bacteria genera are the most known for bioremediation which can be Pseudomonas, uh, Bacillus and other microorganisms such as Mycobacterium, Mycococcus, Nitrosomonas and these are the list goes on. So these are some of the important genera or species of bacteria. So moving on from there. So organisms in micro uh, bioremediation. So these can be of aerobic and anaerobic type definitely. So these are two important types that we have in bioremediation and this is something that is prevalent in every process. So there are aerobic as well as anaerobic bacteria as in this also. So aerobic bacteria we have which uses oxygen as a final electron roller and aerobic bacteria uh, works under hypoxic conditions or oxygen less or no oxygen condition. Also in aerobic bacteria they use they may use contaminants as sole source of carbon and energy so they extract uh, their own source of energy such as carbon energy from the contaminants which they degrade also they degrade pesticides hydrocarbons alkenes and polyaromatics and some of the examples of them are pseudomonas acalogens rhodococcus spingomonas and mycobacterium yeah the spelling is wrong here also so talking about the anaerobic bacteria which are some of them are nitrate reducing bacteria sulfate reducing bacteria so definitely nitrate and sulfate reducing bacteria are always anaerobic in nature a point to remember and these are not used frequently as aerobic bacteria and these are applied for bioremediation of various organic compounds such as polychlorinated biphenyls uh, which are known as pcbs in river sediments are uh, trichloroethanol and benzene so these are some of the important bacteria that are used here on from there so as you can see the organisms in bioremediation we have furthermore aerobic and anaerobic respiration examples as you can see so in the aerobic respiration the organic substrates can be benzene taulin and phenol which are ammonia iron sulfate sulfur maybe sulfur yeah so and the oxygen electron donor that we have here which can be all of the oxygen uh, definitely it requires oxygen so it has oxygen electron donor and the end products as you can see uh, mainly which are CO2 derived uh, uh, end products. So in most cases we find CO2 as the end product and water as well as in some cases we'll find nitrate and nitrite and uh, iron and sulfate. So in anaerobic respiration we have the organic substrates can be benzene, taulin, phenol and also trichloroethanol and the organic substrates uh, benzene and trichloroethylene such as hydrogen we have here and this the oxygen electron donor is different so that's the only point of difference we have here in this we have the oxygen only oxygen is required that's enough for the aerobic respiration whereas in uh, oxygen uh, anaerobic respiration we don't have oxygen we have other electron donors such as nitrates sulfates carbon dioxide all right so in this the end products are lots so as you can see, we have CO2 as well, water, chlorine, sulfur, water, methane, and the list goes on, on and on. And under fermentation, the fermentation is basic, basically an anaerobic process. 
but definitely it carries out in aerobic processes at well, as well. So these are there are different sort of bioreactors that carry out fermentation, and depending on that, the process can be aerobic as well as anaerobic. But in most cases, the process is anaerobic. All right, and this the end product is carbon dioxide and methane. So moving on from there, so talking about some of the fungi and bacteria, so which are able to degrade a diverse range of persistent or toxic environmental pollutants so moving on also do we have plants uh, which are used for bioremediation which are known as phytoremediation and also it involves processes as you can see phyto extraction phyto transformation phyto stabilization and phyto degradation and rhizo filtration so these are some of the important uh, uh, organisms that are involved in bioremediation so let's just keep this video till here i'll be back with another video very soon so stay tuned and thank you for watching this video